Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to rise to speak on this condolence motion for former Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Malcolm Fraser. Mr Fraser, of course, was a dominant figure in national politics in the 1970s and the early 1980s, a period that stands out in my mind because by the late 70s and early 80s I was at high school and starting to become very interested in politics. As the Prime Minister of the day, Mr Fraser was a towering figure, both literally and metaphorically. And as I joined the Young Liberal Movement in 1981, I became much more interested in him and his government and the policies that they were pursuing. I had the opportunity to meet Mr Fraser only once at a Liberal Party function, which would have been, I think, in around 1981 or 1982. And uh, the memory uh, is strong and it made an impact on me. In the time that I have available, I'd like to observe firstly that as a nation we should be profoundly grateful to Fraser for his actions in restoring order at a time of chaos in 1975. I'd also like to acknowledge the way that he demonstrated through his career and through the things that he did while he was Prime Minister and the leading member of a centre-right political party, that moral and ethical principles are not the province of one side of politics. And I thirdly want to reflect briefly on the question of economic policy in the Fraser years. When Malcolm Fraser led the Liberal and National Parties to power in 1975. He did so at a time when many Australians were increasingly alarmed about the chaos, disorder and mismanagement into which our nation was descending thanks to the economic ineptitude of the Whitlam government. I want to quote from an article by Ross Gittins in the Sydney Morning Herald where he assessed the economic performance of Gough Whitlam. And he cited a chapter by John O'Mahony of Deloitte Access Economics in a book, The Whitlam Legacy, edited by Troy Bramston. Gittins notes that O'Mahony's review of the economic statistics had this to say, quotes, the years of the Whitlam government saw the economic growth rate halve, unemployment double and inflation triple, close quotes. Uh, as Gittins notes, by mid-1975 inflation was at 17.6 per cent, wage rises had hit 32.9 per cent and after a boom in 1973 and the first half of 1974, the country was facing a severe recession. There were two particular actions that the Whitlam government took which made the economic situation particularly precarious. He hugely increased government spending and the size of government, and indeed uh, government spending as a ratio of gross domestic product rose by a remarkable six percentage points in a mere three years. The second action of the Whitlam government that Ross Gittins makes some observations about in this article is that while inflation was already running very high, the Whitlam government introduced a series of measures which sharply increased pay levels. Uh, the introduction of equal pay, a fourth week of annual leave and a 17.5 per cent annual leave loading. Gittins has this to say, a rather tart observation. Quotes, Clyde Cameron, Whitlam's Minister for Labor, simply refused to accept that the cost of labor could possibly influence employers' decisions about how much labor they used, close quotes. And uh, Ross Gittins goes on to say this, uh, I think a fair and uh, measured observation, quotes, from today's perspective there's nothing radical about equal pay or four weeks leave, but to do it also quickly and in such an inflationary environment was disastrous, close quotes. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, we should remember that 
this gross economic mismanagement, this very high, troublingly high level of, of uh, inflation, came at the same time as uh, many ministers were behaving in demonstrably self-indulgent ways. And in particular, there was the alarming discovery that a minister of the Crown was seeking, on behalf of the Australian go government, to borrow billions of dollars from an extremely shady figure and to do so uh, while skirting around the normal processes and safeguards of government. It's no exaggeration to say that the economic situation that Australia faced was chaotic and precarious. When you look at the experiences of countries around the world that have tipped into galloping inflation, you can't help but be struck by how profoundly socially damaging that can be. Perhaps the textbook example is Germany, the, the Weimar Republic, where there was uh, an enormous rate of inflation, the savings of middle class people were essentially destroyed, and the degree of social dislocation that uh, resulted is cited by many historians as being one of the causal factors of the Nazis coming to power. So I simply make the point that the consequences of chaotic inflation and economic mismanagement have been seen uh, in a number of nations around the world over a number of years. Argentina is another country that could be cited, Zimbabwe, and the social consequences are always extremely severe. Our country, it's no exaggeration to say, was facing uh, a material threat at the time that Fraser took the bold and decisive action that he did to bring the Whitlam government's time to an end and to have an election at which there was an overwhelming vote, an overwhelming vote for the coalition because the large majority of Australians were extremely anxious about the dangerous economic territory into which the Whitlam government had navigated the country and they were very eager indeed to see economic management back in the hands of people with a proven competence at doing that. And of course the record shows that once the Fraser government came to power, having won that landslide election, uh, it did chart a vastly more economically responsible course. It took some time to retrieve the situation, given the mismanagement that it had inherited, but it navigated in a prudent and responsible fashion, and the dangers that Australia was facing as a result of the economic chaos under the Whitlam government were thankfully avoided. I think Australians have every reason to be very grateful to Malcolm Fraser for his tough-minded and strategic approach to ending the Whitlam government as early as possible, to bringing on an election and to getting into power, which then resulted in being able to pursue a much more sensible and prudent course of economic management, which was very much in the national interest. I think another thing that we can reflect upon as we look at Malcolm Fraser's career is that he demonstrated that he was certainly a man of high principle and he was prepared in government as Prime Minister, as the leader of a centre-right party to act upon those principles and give effect to them. He opened the door to Vietnamese refugees in a way that markedly transformed and made more diverse the character of our country and of course uh, was in many ways a precursor of uh, subsequent uh, uh, stages of immigration from the many nations of Asia which has contributed enormously to the diversity and richness of the modern Australia. He was a leader in the fight against apartheid and in bringing together international action designed to bring to an end uh, the regime which supported apartheid. He introduced many path-breaking environmental reforms. And so I think one of the 
lessons that we can draw from Malcolm Fraser's uh, actions as Prime Minister is that it is quite wrong, quite wrong to assume that one side of politics or the other has any particular mortgage on moral authority. He acted in many ways, in, on many issues, from a classical liberal perspective, a perspective which atta attaches great weight to the rights of the individual, uh, an important moral and ethical tradition and one which is embodied in the modern Liberal Party. The third area I want to reflect on briefly is the question of the process and progress of economic reform in the Fraser years. And in reflecting on that question briefly, it is noteworthy that we've seen within days of the death of Mr Fraser, the death of another very significant statesman in our region, Lee Kuan Yew. And he's remembered for many, many things, but for one very pithy, rather harsh, but extremely powerful observation about Australia that we were at risk of becoming the poor white trash of Asia. And that was something that he said in 1980 when Australia's economy was very much more closed and fixed than it became in the subsequent quarter century. At the time that those comments were made, we did not have a floating exchange rate. It was in the main not possible for foreign banks to operate in Australia. The government was the owner of corporations in many sectors of the economy, both the, one of the two domestic airlines and the international airline, TA and, uh, TAA and Qantas were owned by the government, Commonwealth Bank was owned by the government, many other corporations were owned by government. And within a few years, a few short years, there would be a dramatic reversal in the economic policy, policy orthodoxy and a sustained process of liberalising the Australian economy with a view to making it more flexible and competitive. And so the question for Liberals is whether it is a matter for regret that more, more could not have been achieved in that liberalising direction in the years between 1975 and 1983. I found it instructive to listen to the observations of other speakers in this, on this condolence motion uh, over the past few days. Uh, the member for Barara, who served with Malcolm Fraser in the parliament for many years, when the member for Barara came into the parliament in 1973, spoke about the divisiveness in Australian society that emerged from the circumstances of the 1975 election, the dismissal and the election which followed it, and made the point that this acted as something of a break on the vigour with which the Fraser government felt it could pursue economic reform because of a concern not to worsen divisions which were seen to be very substantial as a result of bitterness which emerged from the dismissal and the subsequent election result. I acknowledge that argument, I respect that argument, but it is interesting, I think, to look at the fact that the intellectual case for economic reform was being made with considerable vigour in the Fraser government years. The Campbell report was a major piece of work looking at uh, changes to the structure of the economy. And of course, when the Hawke government came to power in 1983, another report, the Martin report, which was commissioned, which essentially revisited and drew on much of the substantive work of the Campbell report. So there was certainly intellectual effort within the government as well as outside of it going into the question of whether it was time to change Australia's economic model to liberalise the economy. And 
in the field of telecommunications, there was another major report, the Davidson Report of 1982, which was, I think, another example of exploring deregulatory and uh, liberalising directions, but ultimately directions which were not taken up with any vigour under the Fraser government and where the directions that were pointed to had to wait for some time before they were given effect to. These questions can be debated at length and ultimately we're considering whether a particular path the country took over a number of years was the right one or whether another path could have been taken. Fundamentally there's no answer to that question, but it is certainly interesting that in the observations and reflections that have been made about the Fraser government over the past few days following the death of Malcolm Fraser, a number of observers have mused on that question. Let me close by acknowledging the extraordinary contribution made by Malcolm Fraser in the political life and the history of our nation. He was a member of the parliament for many, many years. He was, as I observed at the outset, the dominant figure in Australian politics for much of the 70s and the early 80s. Many, many decisions that his government took are reflected in features and characteristics of the modern Australia, and it is appropriate that we should acknowledge his contribution, mourn his passing and express condolences to his widow, his family and his friends, and I do that.